This presentation will be about acute pancreatitis with an emphasis on CT and the relatively new Atlanta classification and nomenclature. The Atlanta classification divides pancreatic fluid collections into four different types with these wonderful acronyms that you can see on this slide. A little bit of alphabet soup. Again, we will get to this later on, hopefully in a very simple, easy to understand fashion. Some basic background that you probably already are aware of, but in the United States, pancreatitis, the most common etiologies are alcohol abuse and gallbladder disease. Pancreatitis, while confined to the organ, is actually a systemic response of inflammation, and it's usually diagnosed with two out of the three characteristics of pain, usually, usually epigastric, radiating to the back, worse when you sit up, markedly elevated lipase and amylase, and imaging findings, which is where we as radiologists come into play and in what this lecture is going to be about. We'll be getting to those fluid collections that I mentioned in the second slide, but four random but germane points that are hopefully going to be the most important takeaways from this lecture. The Atlantic classification discourages the use or phrase pancreas abscess or pancreas phlegmon. Instead, we'll be using those four different acronyms for fluid collections, which we will get to later on. Often, and perhaps too often, we'll see reports mentioning enlarged inflamed pancreas can't rule out cancer. Clearly, pancreatitis is far more common than pancreas cancer. So when should we suggest a CT to rule out underlying malignancy? Three things. If it's the first episode of pancreatitis, if the patient is over the age of 40, and if there's no identifiable reason for the pancreatitis. If it's idiopathic, we don't know why, with those other two factors, then it's a little bit more reasonable to recommend a follow-up to exclude an underlying carcinoma. Third point is that, interestingly, the imaging findings do not correlate with the clinical severity of the pancreatitis. And the fourth important point is, on CT, do not diagnose pancreatic necrosis within the first 72 hours of disease onset, only after the first 72 hours. Um, this will be mentioned several times in this lecture because it's quite important, so I will try and drive this point home. The Atlantic classification predominantly divides pancreatitis into early and later phases and fluid collection nomenclature. Early phases, the first two weeks, late phases, two weeks, or further on out, up to, up to months. But again, two weeks for early, two weeks or more for late. And so just realize that even though it's called the late phase, it really can still be an within the acute framework if it's within weeks three or four. I'm going to show you two tables, which just be aware of them. I don't commit them to memory, just be, know they exist, just in case it comes up in conversation with referring clinicians. There is a CT grading for pancreatitis, which for someone like me who likes to keep things very simple, I'm more of a lumper than a splitter, when I see a chart like this, this is my gut response. The interstitial pancreatitis is pretty much our garden variety of pancreatitis that we see every day and every night that we're working. It usually resolves in a week, and it's the classic, you know, enlarged pancreas, various degrees of enhancement, peripancreatic inflammation with possible fluid collections. Here's a nice case of acute pancreatitis with the edematous pancreas circled with orange and the normal appearing or more normal appearing pancreas tail with the orange arrow. Necrotizing pancreatitis involves basically two parameters, either parenchymal necrosis, peripancreatic necrosis, or more commonly, both of them.
we can evaluate the homogeneity or heterogeneity of the pancreas fluid collections with CT. It may be a little more accurate with MRI and, in theory, ultrasound. I'm reticent to recommend ultrasound in these cases because usually the patients have a lot of bowel gas. And uh, to me, it seems a little bit redundant with CT, but that's just my personal opinion. So here we go. Four types of fluid collections with acronyms. It may initially appear complicated. I'm going to try and simplify it. So the four types of fluid collections, we divide that into two that are interstitial and two that are necrotic. Most of the nomenclature, fortunately, is intuitive or makes sense once you read it. So acute peripancreatic fluid collection, pretty self-explanatory, that may go on to immature pseudocyst. And if it's a little difficult, sort of a simple way or a kindergarten way to remember these or is that these both have the letter P in them. The necrotic collections, again, pretty well named. Acute necrotic collection after two weeks, ANC, and that may mature into Waldorf necrosis. And these both have the letter N in them. Hopefully it helps. Maybe, maybe not. Here's a nice classic pseudocyst. Note the circumscribed wall homogeneous attenuation and extrinsic mass effect upon pancreas with the tail displaced posteriorly. So here is a daunting table describing the fluid collections. And when I see something like this, I want it broken down into the easiest, simplest, fewest points to make it comprehensible and memorable. So the fluid collections associated with interstitial edematous pancreatitis, the APFC, acute peripancreatic fluid collection, the pseudocyst, the contents on CT are homogeneous. They are adjacent to the pancreas and push on it, perhaps, but they are not intrapancreatic. The necrotizing fluid collections, acute necrotizing collection and Waldorf necrosis, their contents are heterogeneous and they may be extrinsic to the pancreas but also within the pancreas parenchyma, unlike the interstitial fluid collections, which usually are outside of the pancreas. The two fluid collections in the early phase, as you would expect, don't have a definable wall. And in their later phases, the pseudocyst or the Waldorf necrosis, Waldorf makes this pretty easy to understand or remember, they have a well-defined enhancing wall, which is typical for any inflammatory process in the body where a fluid collection gets walled off, whether it be an intraperitheal abscess um, or organizing hematoma or a seroma, or in this case, these pancreatic mature fluid collections later on, the pseudocyst and the walled off necrosis. The post necrostomy pseudocyst, I'm not gonna talk much about that because it's very rare. It's a cyst that arises after a resection of pancreas tissue. And again, it has a well-defined enhancing wall, as you would expect from the name pseudocyst, as we see here in the, towards the middle part of the slide. So this was the second slide I showed you. So now hopefully this will make a little more sense. The interstitial pancreatitis fluid collections and the necrotizing to each. The acute peripancreatic fluid collection, the APFC, homogeneous with out of discrete wall, maturing to a more discrete wall with the classic ubiquitous pseudocyst. The necrotizing fluid collections, again, no discrete wall, contents are heterogeneous. As time goes on, it still maintains the heterogeneity, but a nice wall is formed. So hopefully that makes these a little bit easier to digest and remember. A nice diagram reinforcing that pseudocysts are extrinsic to the pancreas. In the bottom two pictures, they may push on the pancreas and produce upstream ductal dilatation. In contrast to the pseudocyst, the walled off mature necrotic collection often is either intraparenchymal or extraparenchymal, but often communicates with the duct drains into it. And because it's not pressing on the duct to the degree of a pseudocyst, we don't usually see upstream ductal dilatation. Of course, there are exceptions, and these are just general guidelines. 
So here's a case of complicated pancreatitis. We have the relatively normal pancreas in white. So the interstitial pancreatitis has improved, but we do have these peripancreatic fluid collections, which are heterogeneous with areas of interspersed fat, no discrete wall. So this is an acute necrotic collection. Again, heterogeneous, no discrete wall. These two slides are fairly busy, but again, nasty case of necrotizing pancreatitis in image A. We can see areas of fat marked by the black arrows. We see incidental splenic vein thrombosis annotated by the pale blue arrow. And again, these acute peripancreatic fluid collections, fairly homogeneous, no wall. Later on, in this particular patient, this went on to become Waldorf necrosis. Here's the pancreas parenchyma, Waldorf necrosis, which again, remember, can be intrapancreatic or peripancreatic heterogeneous with these septations. So the contents here look fairly homogeneous, but we get these septations and a discrete wall. As you are aware in your everyday practice, it seems like everybody has a pancreas tail pseudocyst who's over the age of 60 and often get referred for follow-up at MRI. One micro pearl is if we get a cyst like this on MR and there's central decreased T2 signal, fairly dark or almost a signal void, that is fairly typical for Waldorf necrosis and it's very unlikely to be malignant. To reiterate, the Atlantic classification discourages the use of the terms abscess or phlegmon. We see a fluid collection within it, the pancreas, and we see air bubbles, which in the past we would say is an abscess. They prefer the term superinfection or superinfected collection.